Thank you very much for coming. Um, first thing is, as we had already uh, 20 minutes with um, Frédéric to discuss about Société Générale, he has a bit of advance on you, so uh, I don't give you 20, but if in two minutes you could present who you are, I think you are a banker also somewhere in your life, uh, and what is Atom Bank, because we are, many people here are French, even if we are 40% non-French, but they don't all know who you are, so please take sure. two or three minutes for that. It is the story of competition in banking that, that the big established bank gets 20 minutes and the new bank gets two. No, no, we have 25 <laughs> minutes together, don't worry. It's a, it's, it's a useful <laughs> metaphor. So, so Atom Bank is a, a small new bank. Uh, it was established in, as a business in 2014. It, uh, it was licensed as a bank in uh, 2015 and unrestricted, in other words, trading, uh, just last year. Uh, it uh, has started lending and gathering deposits, uh, so lending to small businesses and lending to residential mortgage customers in the UK. Um, and we continue to build our capabilities so that we will offer a full range of, of, of banking products and services, either manufactured by us or partnered with us uh, throughout <coughs> 2017 and into 2018. It's uh, distributed principally using uh, smart technology or smartphones, um, but we also have partnerships with a variety of, of broker groups in the UK. So that's who we are. When I met you the uh, first time a, mo a bit more than one year ago and when I, I pushed you to come, um, you explained to me we're not like all many neo banks we're speaking at this time because from the day one you wanted to be a real bank with your balance sheet and so on. I mean, you didn't really believe in the light banking thing. Is that, could you just tell us a bit more about there are so many neo bank things, you know, so many different. I think there's a, a great deal of uncertainty. If you're going to raise capital from investors, and we've raised a lot of capital. How oh, much, sorry? About, uh, to date, we've raised 135 million pounds. Of course, the pound has devalued significantly. So, Until yes, a few weeks ago, it was good. <laughs> Until a few weeks ago in euros, it was looking good, but now it's looking a little less good. Um, by the time we, we get out of quarter one of this year, we'll have raised uh, well over 200 million pounds. So it's a lot of money from investors. And if you're going to raise a lot of money from investors, then you have to uh, have a credible plan to give it back to them. And I know that sounds terribly obvious, but when you then look at the uncertainties about how the fintech world will evolve, what will monetize? Will customer behaviors change? Will they trust their data to unknown companies? Will they buy from unknown brands? A huge amount of uncertainty we wanted to ensure that we had a firm foundation to our business. And a firm foundation to our business was actually quite a traditional model. Go out and gather deposits and, and create a spread on a balance sheet by lending them to businesses. So, so to that extent, we're a hybrid. We're not apologetic for being a hybrid because the future is very uncertain, but the need to save, the need to borrow, buy a home, finance a life, pay for education, those are constants and we wanted to be attached to those needs and those opportunities as part of our strategy. Last question before we go to the real game. Um, before creating that, because we all have white hairs, so you're just, I'm not 22 creating, it's just after the school, like Oli yesterday, so um, you were a banker before, I mean. You yes, it is very unfashionable to be a banker, but I am a banker. I spent my entire career in banking and financial services. I have always loved the industry. Again, you know, stone me now that I think it's a fascinating industry. I think it's an important industry. I've always believed that. I think it has, a, has done a terrible job of explaining itself to people who vote and people who pay taxes. I think it's behaved badly at various different points over the last 15 to 20 years. I would like to say I wasn't in it, but I was. So uh, you know, in, in the UK, there's a, a gamekeeper turned poacher, which is a, you, know, you leave an industry and then you attack it. To some extent, I do that. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm part of the, of the banking industry. I, I won't deny that. Thank you. So now for the next 15 minutes, the game will be very easy. I will ask exactly the same question, question to both of you, um, which is focus on retail, Frederick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you both have different experience, different, of course, reality today. Um, so main question is, what is a bank, retail bank of the future? I don't know what is future, two years, 10 years, five years, I don't know. But I will ask you this question. So we have seven or eight questions like that. Uh, the first one is, is there a space for branches? Um, yesterday, Orange CEO explained on the very same stage uh, that for Orange, the distribution network is an asset. And on the opposite, um, we see, at least in France, 
uh, many branch closure in, in, in some banks. I must say I had a Société Générale in my street. I don't have any more since six months. Um, so do you think, and, and you, you are mainly mobile, you don't have branches, or perhaps you have some deals you will explain, but do you think there is like 20 years ago this discussion, click only, click on motor, uh, or it will be only click? Both of you, so first, uh, Mark, because you are just arrived. <laughs> so, so logically, I see no future for branches. There is nothing inherent in banking that requires a physical branch to exist in order for information to be exchanged or for money to be exchanged. Logically, therefore, branches in, in this technological age uh, have no, I think, uh, rational purpose. Emotionally, on the other hand, branches still have an important role to play for certain types of customers. And that's because banking is not for 35-year-olds. Banking is for 90-year-olds, and it's for 19-year-olds, and for all of the age ranges in between. And the range and pace at which they are prepared to change their behavior or adopt new ideas and new, new, new uh, tools and, uh, varies. So if you're a new bank, it makes no sense for you to build a, a, a distribution model to serve that wide range of customers, so we don't. If you're an existing bank, of course, you've got a more complex problem to solve. And so, so emotionally, they have a role, but, but logically for me, they So don't. for you, you, you just keep uh, the niche of the one who don't need the branch. Correct. Frederick, same question. Well, first of all, let me say, I, I think I, I agree very much with what uh, you've just said and, and, and in the way to approach uh, what we call online banking, and there's a lot of confusion, but you need to enter again into the detail of what is being provided by these banks. We, in, in Boursorama, we do exactly what you say. We provide the full range of services. Credit, savings, current account, debit card, etc. I mean, that's what I, I think um, makes sense in terms of thinking about online banking. We, I believe uh, that if you wish, again, in the foreseeable future, there will be a uh, room for different models. Exactly uh, according to what Mark said, we see already with Boursorama, which is the leading online bank in France, people who can deal with all their banking needs with no branches. But we should also think that the existing networks, first of all, I come back to my point, they deal for more than half of their revenues with corporate clients. It's absolutely key, and for the foreseeable future, we see the need for proximity. Second, as Mark said, and, and, and when I think about the future or, of multi-channel uh, distribution banks, there is everything around savings. If you can easily deal with a bank on a current account and borrow, for a certain period of time, I think, and exactly with what you say with this question of brands that, brand that you might not know necessarily, or emotionally, the benefit, the comfort of meeting with someone you know and you can trust, before you will put a, lot of, a, a, a big amount of money of your savings, which will be there for your next 30 years, for the retirement, etc. In a, in a Europe, uh, Europe landscape where people are getting older and public pension systems will go down, saving will be key. And for me, before at least a certain number of years, there will be a lot of room to develop this activity of advisory as a complement to providing services which can be transactional services online. I would like to insist, Société Générale and Crédit du Nord Networks have multi-channel systems, online systems, which are among the best in the market, and people do not go to their branches to just look at their current account, put cash, etc. So the, the behaviors are changing. There will be less branches, but I see also a future for this multi-channel uh, business model. Second question. Um, we had big discussion yesterday, and today we have in the pitch room nine fintech on PFM, personal finance management. So all, the, all those actors, they are saying tomorrow you don't need your bank application. So you were telling us Société Générale application is a big one. I already heard you on, on radio saying that it is the second or third one people look at the morning. Okay, what happens if tomorrow there are all these PFM applications just they don't in front of the customer and they don't go to your app or they don't go to your app? So do you think tomorrow um, customer in retail will use their banking app, yours or yours, or more an aggregator like the PFM or why not a GAFA uh, doing the same job? So, so I think they will use both. Um, we 
we know uh, we are literally in the middle of uh, debriefing a piece of research at the moment, and it's very clear that uh, those customers who understand and are interested in uh, the use of data value independence. I think independence is a challenge for an estab a long-established banking brand. And, and it's a challenge for the concept of the banking model. The concept of the banking model is that universal banks are self-hedged, so they are a blend of short, long, big, small, corporate, consumer, secured, unsecured, um, and essentially liabilities and assets, and they're all self-hedged. The, the, the offer is that you can come to that institution and all of your banking and financial services needs can be served by that institution, that one-stop shop model. That is the nature, the essence of the, if you like, concentration of, of banking in Europe, and certainly in the UK. The weakness of that model for a consumer, for, for a, a buyer, is that the pricing that they experience is driven by a single treasury, the single balance sheet, essentially. And the argument is, therefore, that if you can access multiple treasuries and multiple balance sheets, you can actually arbitrage or or you can trade off and pass power from the single bank to back to the customer. Here's the thing. PFM isn't going to make you richer, necessarily. PFM may well tell customers what they don't want to know. There's a huge amount of research now into behavioral science and behavioral psychology about people not wanting to know what the state of their finances are. Um, but one thing it will do, and I do genuinely believe this, is that it will find out, it will discover inefficiencies in the banking system. You have to, we, we in Atom believe that you have to be able to make money on a single product basis. In other words, a bank, we think, has to be composed of multiple monoline products so that if the only product that a customer buys is a credit card or a personal loan or a current account, then you can make money on that single product. Because if you can't do that, then PFM and aggregation is designed to disaggregate the banking model. And I think that's a good thing because it's going to force banks, one, to make revenues honestly, and two, to become more efficient. I would, not, I would not disagree, and again, on, on PFM and aggregation, we, we develop our own offer. So we think it's, it's a, a trend which will develop towards further transparency. As you said, the capacity uh, with all the regulation to ensure that you price adequately for each service. At the same time, same thing, at least in the foreseeable future, I'm not sure that all clients in France will want to go ex for, for an aggregator because their needs might be might not request this kind of thing, depending on where they stand, you know. Uh, you are 55, you have a lot of saving capacity, it's not necessarily the same needs of a young student who wants perhaps to borrow just for paying his studies, and, and that's it, you know. The, the needs of the client base is pretty different. And regarding, as I've said, the, the corporate world, the corporate world is still, if you wish, a, a world of multi-banking. We should not forget, we, we should, Think also about multi-banking at the end of the day, development. So they might, for example, I can absolutely uh, envisage <coughs> that a client can use Boursorama for transactions and Societe Generale for its savings and private banking needs. Thank you. Um, some VCs told me yesterday on that stage that I was wrong thinking that security and trust was really an eye issue because when they do study, sometimes, because we were speaking of PFM, and sometimes they say it's most of the time gray air question because when they ask the customer, they don't care so much. What is your point of view about this security issue? Because you, often when you do UX, and in your case, UX is very important, security is a bit an enemy of uh, UX, you know, asking different code and so on. So just quick answer because I have six other questions. So. Okay, so, so very quickly, security is an issue when if and when the banking industry passes losses to the customer. So we've worked in an environment where essentially any losses, the majority of losses incurred by a customer as a result of compromise of security are carried by the institution. They're just carried as a cost of doing business in the main. If we enter a world where it becomes, uh, where the model changes and you actually start to enforce terms and conditions, 
or you actually start to ensure that the consumer carries loss, then attitude to security will transform very quickly. I think we're going to enter that world. I think we're going to enter that world because it is virtually impossible to create the perfect defense system around any institution, not just a bank, but any institution. And in the last six months, we have certainly seen examples of that, have we not? So, so the issue is about loss. The customer will care if it starts to cost them money. They'll care very, very deeply about it. And there are examples, increasing numbers of examples, where that is happening. Again, I would say, I, I would agree. Again, we are, I think, moving towards this world. Again, security concerns, I think, will grow. You will have uh, multiple examples where, whether it's uh, data leakage or direct losses in a way or another, that will impact more and more the, the clients. And, and that, from that perspective, being able to maintain the reputation of security is absolutely key. It can be for fintech banks, it's the same challenge but it's going to remain uh, and, and, and become even more important going forward. I stay with you, Frédéric, for one question. Um, we come from a producer-distributor world in banks. Uh, you do your product and you distribute your product. A bit opposite to what we'll see a bit later with uh, AXA, where in insurance, there is producer and many, many distributors. So um, with PSD2, service aggregation, and so on, there are many discussions about the new kind of banking where you, a banker like you could be more an aggregator, you have the customer relationship, and perhaps you integrate in your interface transfer-wise service for the transfer of money or uh, Finex cap service for the factoring because you think perhaps they are more efficient than your own internal services. Do you think that could be a trend, even if you explained us that the application was fully done inside, but perhaps tomorrow you will be more like uh, you have some core services and some others that you just plug? Do you think it could be a trend for a big bank like you? Yeah, and again, uh, I think we need to be flexible. There's no taboo, and uh, we've shown, you know, with the creation of Amundi that we can be also distributor of products which are not manufactured by us. So, I mean, there, there's not, uh, we cannot think about the world going forward uh, of uh, monopoly and, and silo uh, production with distribution. Again, the, the question will be to ensure do we provide the best service because there will be transparency, quality of service, transparency on pricing, the best service to the clients. And if there is a product manufacturer which can work better, we will have to, to do that. So I, I don't believe in that uh, silo uh, uh, going forward. Same for you, Mark, with a side question. Yesterday, uh, Ricky Knox from Tandem Bank told us he did a, a deal with a distributor, a retail distributor, to distribute its product in the shop. So you have two questions, the distribution production. You could be aggregating some other services of FinTech, but you could be also sold in other portals or whatever. I think there are lots of opportunities to, to monetize the emerging technology model in, in, in banking. But there are two problems that have to be resolved, and, and to my knowledge, they haven't been quite resolved yet. In an open architecture ecosystem, which is the ecosystem that PSD2 promises, and, and, and in the UK it's called open banking, but it's the same thing. In that system, two questions have to be resolved. Where does liability sit? If you initiate a journey on a platform and you complete that journey in a manufacturer, who advised you to buy it? Where does the legal liability for the customer journey sit? Is it with the originator and the distributor, or is it with the manufacturer, or is it between the two of them, and how can that be resolved? The second question is, how do you service the customer in the long run? Because lots of banking and financial products are open-ended. They're not finite contracts. They're not fixed-term contracts. Checking account is an example, a credit card is an example, et cetera, et cetera. Are we saying that platforms are going to maintain API relationships and or corporate relationships in perpetuity with manufacturers? No. So, so, so if those relationships break down between your aggregator and the underlying manufacturers, what's the impact for the customer? Do they have to go to a different aggregator? Do they have to go direct to that manufacturer? How does the ecosystem create stability in the long run? Because here's the thing about the one-stop shop model, the universal banking model, which is often not understood. It is a highly evolved model. It may be self-interested, but it's also a highly evolved model. One of the issues that the ecosystem brings is everyone wants to make money in it. There is nobody out in the fintech world that I'm aware of uh, who have set up a charitable foundation. Are you? Are you is anyone sort of providing APIs on a charitable basis? I haven't met them. 
And what you're therefore looking at is, trans is exchanging one ecosystem for another ecosystem. Now, at the moment, it makes sense because the established model is inefficient. But there will come a point where the 2B model, the digital ecosystem, is essentially quite an inefficient model too. And, and I think we, it's early yet, but, but to my mind, that's coming. Thank you. Um, just as I am with you, yesterday Matthias uh, Kroner told us here that he made the choice to sell to uh, BPC because he saw that um, the cost of doing a new bank, however you call it, alone in B2C was so high, uh, even in online only, that if he wanted to do a big bank in 10 years, he has no other choice. Um, Difficult to ask you that question, but do you think uh, you, you will manage to raise enough money to be really a big one alone independent or at a time? It will be also a question for you to work more with one big bank. For example, one will give you already a lot of money. Or I think it's very important to understand how you're going to compete, right? And, and, and if you think you're going to, there's lots of new banks out there. Lots of them have, see an opportunity, a segment, a niche. They can see how they can get to profitability, how they can get to break even, because these are big markets. These are big revenue pools. You can make a credible business model out of it. If your motivation in coming into the industry is to make some money and get out, then, then there's lots of, of business. And there's nothing wrong with that, guys, because that creates value, and it changes things, and it improves things, and it, it stimulates competition. I've got no objection to it. But it isn't going to change banking. It is not going to change banking fundamentally, and, and it's not going to address some of the core if you like, customer weaknesses of the, of the banking model, which I'm, I'm very passionate about. I take inspiration from, of all companies, Ryanair. Because in, Ryan, in 1985, Ryanair was essentially one aircraft and one route between two small cities in Ireland. Now, it is one of the world's biggest airlines, and it dominates low-cost travel in Europe. How? How did a business that essentially is in a highly commoditized market go from nothing to be the dominant force in an industry over the space of 20 years? The answer is quite simple. It changed the expectation and the pricing dynamics of an entire cartel, right? Because it understood that if you, if you don't kill your customer, and that has to come without saying, so that you can't jeopardize the security of your customer. But if you do protect your customer, they are willing to compromise in pursuit of value. But not slightly better value, fundamentally better value. The bank that wins, the fintech that wins, is the bank or the fintech that completely challenges the consumer's assumption of how much something should cost. That's not 10% cheaper. That's 90% cheaper. If you build something that's 90% cheaper, anybody in the established industry had better look out. I think the answer to the question is, we will only matter if we are prepared to challenge the core pricing assumptions of the banking industry. We need investors to believe that that's worthwhile doing. But there are examples in other industries where that is exactly what has happened. Very shortly, do you think, Frédéric, that Very some new banks could, could survive? Boursorama is exactly in that space. Boursorama is the cheaper bank, the cheapest bank in France. Probably, uh, if you think about it, at least for the services they provide, which is not as developed as traditional banks, probably that kind of magnitude. Boursorama is one, has one million clients, aims to have two million in, more than two million in 2020. And I can think about the Boursorama with six, seven, eight million clients in the coming years. I believe in the long run, scale will be important. You will not have a multitude of profitable online bank going forward. So in 10 years time, personally, if we think about banking, as we have been saying, relatively comprehensive set of services with the technicalities that we don't speak about, which are traditional ones, just managing the balance sheet and the liabilities and assets, which is very core in the banking industry beyond technology. I don't think you will have a lot of players you will have, I think, a few banks in most markets which will have scale and which will be profitable in that new paradigm. That leads me, with, when you say, speak about markets, to another point. Um, we had a discussion yesterday on new banks also with Valentin Staff, who explained how number 26 just launched, uh, sorry, N26, just launched in many geographies in the same time. And every time I check, 
I don't have a big bank like yours or BNP or whatever or big one uh, from other geographies who offer me the same interface, user experience and banking experience over different geographies. It's always very different by country. So do you think, the question is for both, we will see more and more in Europe, because we are European, even if we have some Brexit guy, do you think that we will see more and more uh, pan-European offers, which is a niche market when many fintech are going, trying to offer the same kind of service to many people, millennials, all over Europe? Personally, I think it's uh, a very long-term thing. It's very complex. Markets remain very fragmented still in terms of products. You don't have one uh, centralized identific electronic ident identification tool for Europe. It might be the long-term goal, but I would say it's uh, beyond the next 10 years uh, if I talk about scale. Oh, but big mass, we are not speaking of niche. Exactly. I, I think it's a, a long-term thing. Same for you. I had the great privilege of working in the Middle East for, for a number of years where there's a shared culture, a shared language, albeit with regional dialectic variations, a shared religion that, that binds uh, countries from Morocco right through to Pakistan. Yeah, it's an enormous region, it's an enormous geography. You would look at that and you would think it must be possible with the shared language, shared culture, shared religion, in many respects a shared climate, to build consistent, simple, regional propositions and regional customer experiences. It is not. It is not. It turns out that people who live in Qatar are not the same as people who live in Bahrain, are not the same who, as people who live in Dubai, are not the same as people who live in Algeria. Who knew? Who knew that people would insist on being different? If you then come to Europe, you have more complexity, more cultural diversity, more linguistic diversity, more religious diversity. And that means that I think, yes, there are niches. There are pan-European people, absolutely. But I don't think it's a generalism that I would, 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 would necessarily respond to. There are, there are things that can bring us together, but the joy of Europe for me is the, the diversity of it. And, and I think that that actually translates into discrete and different banking relationships. So whatever the Brexit side, the answer is the same. Um, two last questions. In a low interest rate, you already answered a bit on that, Mark, but in a low interest rate world uh, with no more interchange and all the question you mentioned about the need to make money on different products, um, will the retail bank in the future will be more expensive for the retail customer? I mean, um, globally speaking, we have already seen that, for example, in France, we have more and more costs for just day-to-day -day, uh, operation. People are used, as you were mentioned, mentioning, not to pay for service, but it's not a public service. You are not doing a charity business. So do you think, with all this evolution, and technology has a cost, it's not free, uh, we will see the end of the free meal discussion where FinTech gives everything, and even sometimes Borsorama gives everything, if I may say. Uh, and sometimes things will have a cost, a bit more. First of all, I think let's not take for granted that interest rate will remain low forever. Uh, beyond interest rate, also, there is the margin on credit. And I would again come back to the, the Mark's point. I think there will be a, a re-engineering of the way tariffs are, are being uh, priced or services are being priced. Uh, probably credit today is too cheap to a certain extent. Uh, on the other hand, you will see also fees and commission going down on other products and services. Overall, we are in a world where I think the, the, the revenue pool will go down and, and the services will be provided probably at a cheaper level for even more efficiency. So I think it's a, a question of adjusting the distribution channels, uh, segmenting the clients and providing overall a better service probably for a cheaper price going forward on the B2C. <laughs> at the same time, you will have to pay for effectively significant investments, and as I come back to the credit and deposits, the security on this and the, well, the management of that is not so easy. I have a real passion about this subject. I, <laughs> I, I think that it, it is inherently misleading to tell customer that something is free when it isn't. I think it's anti-competitive. It is anti-competitive in most markets where you have a new brand or a new product or a new idea, you're competing against a proposition that is priced. Some banking products are comparable with each other. They are priced. Many banking products are not. Namely, a checking account in the UK, you don't know what it's costing you to run a current account because it looks free. Well, it isn't free. It's just that somebody else is paying for it or you're paying for it, but you don't know how. I, I make a point in the UK that in, 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 in England, it is illegal, it is illegal to sell alcohol as a loss-leading product. You cannot knowingly 
offer alcohol to a consumer and make a loss on the sale. It is not illegal to sell a finance product to a customer at a loss. Now tell me, can a finance product be bad for a customer's health? Is that a controversial idea? I don't think so. It should be illegal. It should be illegal, I think, to sell, knowingly sell a banking product as a loss leader. Because all it's saying is that we're going to charge somebody else for your free ride. Or actually, we're going to charge you, but you're not going to know about it. I fundamentally agree, disagree with it. Thank you very much. My last question, we are very late, but my last question is, do you think the real competitors of tomorrow are, let's say, not badly, but you against you, meaning fintechs and big one, or perhaps a bit later when they will see the end of the game, the big one like GAFAs or the equivalent in China and so on, just stop to play, take the new technology when they are mature and end of the game for some. Many people say Google could buy you if they want. So uh, do you think, what do you think are the real competition tomorrow? Or other like Orange or insurance that can do tomorrow banking much more easily with PSD2 and so on? So same question for both of you. And this is the last one, by the way. Can, can I say, uh, we need to always to be very humble and uh, uh, think about a world of uh, multi, uh, many competitors. At the same time, personally, I'm not sure that entering into banking, banking is a very specific sector. Again, when I say banking, it's not just payment. Payment is normal, it's part of the business model of the GAFAs. Having a single click is part of their business model. It's a way also to conquer data. So obviously, they will enter into that, uh, that space. They're already there. But when I talk about banking, which is about collecting money, protecting this money, uh, advising people, people regarding the, invest, the savings, and lending, there are at least for the time being a set of regulation which makes this business more complex than people think, and I'm not sure that there is a particular interest of these guys to enter this highly regulated, non-particularly profitable business today, at least in Europe, in the foreseeable future. Again, uh, the world is uncertain. I'm trying at least to think about the next five to 10 years, Beyond this, we might all be replaced by robots, but it's another story. Thank you. Mark, your last words. Yes, no, so I, uh, I, I very much agree, but uh, so my crystal ball would never have predicted the US election result or Brexit, <laughs> right? So I'm, I am obviously a bad reader of the future. So, so what we do in response is I don't worry about it. I don't worry about whether the Facebooks of this world or the Googles of this world or the Apples of this world want to build <laughs> their franchises into the banking industry. They may well want to do that. Um, but, but your point is absolutely right in, in the sense that banking is actually, for me, about risk. It's about the management of risk in all sorts of different ways. And that's a quite a sophisticated thing. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not unlearnable. We should never think that somebody else out there can't do it better. That would be a very foolish sort of assumption to make. But it's not necessarily a core competence either for lots of these businesses. We shall see. What's more important is that you have to engineer your culture and your architecture to be flexible and agile because you don't know the future. What you do know is that the future is bloody uncertain. Some things will change, some things will win, some things will not. What you want to be able to do is move swiftly. Experiment quickly, fail, but move swiftly in followership. Yeah, there's lots of talk in banking about let's lead. Now, hold on there. There's too many great ideas in this room and in fintech rooms around Europe and around the world. Let's follow, but let's follow quickly too. So from my mind, it's about agility and it's about ensuring that you have the capabilities to respond quickly to what will be a very uncertain five to 10 years. I, I, I would like, again, it's amazing to see how we agree uh, with very different business model. The core part of our strategy going forward is exactly what you said, agility. For a company of 145,000 people, it means in particular, in my mind, sharing the same culture, sharing the same ambition, and fundamentally have people who understand that, as you said, the world is uncertain, we have no certainty, the key issue is to adapt. Thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you very much. You can applaud them. <laughs>